Hi everyone, thanks for joining in. I'm excited to have Emma Viscuit joining me. Hi Emma. Hello. So a little bit about Emma. Emma is author of the internationally acclaimed Caleb Zellick series. Her novels have won numerous prizes, including a Ned Kelly Award and an unprecedented five David Awards. Emma's debut novel, Resurrection Bay, was shortlisted for the UK's prestigious Gold Dagger and New Blood Dagger Awards, and it was recently voted for one of the decade's best crime novels by the UK, but sorry, by the Crime Time UK. Before becoming an author, Emma was a classical clarinetist. She studied at the Victorian College of Arts in Australia and the Rotterdam Conservatory. Con I'm not even going to be able to say con. That's what we, we just still okay. get lazy. In the, in the Netherlands and her musical career ranged from performing with Jose Carreras and Dan Curry to Kanoa to playing in an engagement party that ended in a brawl so that sounds like a very interesting lineup um, and her latest book is Those Who Perish I can see yours in the background there as well so thanks so much for joining us just wondering if you want to start off by telling us a bit about Those Who Perish and a bit about about the series as well? Uh, yeah, so Those Who Perish is the fourth novel in the, um, well, sometimes we call it the Caleb Zellick series mm. um, because my hero, Caleb, uh, is very much the centre of all the books. He is sort of the, the reason um, why I wrote them, I guess. Uh, it can be read as a standalone, but it's... Um, I mean, absolutely can be read as a standalone, but mm. it's, it's very much the homecoming of the series. So the very first novel, Resurrection Bay, when you first meet Caleb, if you, if you read them in order, um, he's very much a loner. He's very isolated. He's uh, estranged from his family, from most of his friends. Um, and he is in many ways uh, a very typical private detective, loner, down on his luck, um, very stubborn mm. he's a little unusual though in that he is also profoundly deaf mm. he uses auslan sign language to communicate and he lip reads very well um so by those who perish the the last novel um he's grown a lot he's tried to grow a lot mm. Sometimes he's been successful, sometimes he hasn't, um, but he's been reconnecting with some people. And so in Those Who Perish, uh, it starts where he has been trying to find his uh, um, semi-estranged brother, that they have a, a loving relationship, but also um, very much at loggerheads. His mm. brother is also a uh, recovering drug addict. He's been missing for quite some months. Caleb gets an anonymous message in the middle of the night that his brother Ant is in danger in the hometown of Resurrection Bay. Caleb rushes there in the middle of the night, walks straight into the middle of a shootout in the foreshore park. And being in the middle of the night, he does not have his hearing aids in. Mm. He is unaware that mm. there is a shootout mm. in the middle of the park. And things uh, pretty much go downhill from there for the rest of the book for him. Mm. And I have to say what you said about being able to read them alone. I think I've I've read um, Those Who Perish and I've read one of your others. And yeah, and I don't think it doesn't take away anything from not reading them all in order and that as well. So that's really great. I'm just wondering why did you decide to make um, Caleb profoundly deaf? It was... A really long and really short process of deciding. Mm. <laughs> so there's two answers to that question. One is that um, in many ways I didn't actually decide it. It just happened. Uh, and I can trace back the origins of his character all the way back to my writing in primary school. I've been writing ever since I could read. So around four or five, I was writing little stories. Mm. And Ca aspects of Caleb's character have been like, popping in all the time. Like my first, very first story that was published in uh, like um, education department magazine, you know, when I was 12, was about a, a blind man. Mm, and then okay. I wrote a novella about a girl who was mute. Oh, and then really? Was, you know, yeah. so there's this theme that comes, that comes. Is that something um, like you were exposed, those sorts of people? Did you have people that you... I, 
No, not um, very little in my work is directly um, uh, like mirrors mm. my life, but uh, I can now work out absolutely some of the origins. One is that, um, so my, my father is, was Croatian. Mm. Um, he, he didn't speak English until he went to school actually. Um, and, uh, but he wouldn't teach it to us. It was, it was very common in those days. Mm. You just, you know, immigrant family, you don't learn to, um, to speak mm. the language of your forebears. Um, so our grandparents came to live with us when I was maybe eight ish or so. And they didn't speak any English mm. and I didn't speak any Croatian. So that was a real, that was a real shock. And they were my only grandparents. So that inability to communicate and, and watching how comfortable they were with the Slav community and how uncomfortable they were with the rest mm. of, you know, the community, uh, I think it made a big impact. Um, but I think perhaps on a, on a deeper level, um, it's probably just that I was such a weird kid. I was an absolute outsider. <laughs> I really, I had a lot of trouble working out the rules of the world and the school ground. Um, I mean, I, I discovered much, much later on that I've got ADHD. So uh, I think, um, yeah, I, my brain works a little differently to a lot of other people's around me. So I think it's just that feeling of just being a bit of an outsider and, and having to watch and having to be really switched on to work out how things work. And so that mm. sort of all filtered into Caleb's character. The really short answer, of course, is that he popped into my head and I thought, wow, that'll be excellent for a detective. Because mm. <laughs> it does add a lot of um, natural tension uh, to the books, which is really helpful for me as a writer. He, he doesn't know if people are sneaking up behind him. He doesn't know if he's managed yeah. to read everything accurately. He doesn't know if people are sort of whispering behind him. So um, it was a real gift to me, really, mm. even though it sort of led to a lot of writing difficulties. Mm. Mm. And what sort of research did you do for this? Oh, so much. Uh, mm. It's ongoing, really. Mm. I mean, even now I finished um, Those Who Perish, I'm, I'm still learning Auslan. So yeah, I, I learned Auslan, I guess is, is the biggest thing uh, I did. Um, and and I've continued learning that. Like it's been an on and off pro process. I tried to learn <laughs> to lip read. <laughs> I did a, right at the beginning, I, I did an online uh, lip reading course and mm. I just thought I was so clever and I'd be able to, you know, go and eavesdrop on people in public or lip drop on people <laughs> and I uh, you know I put little earbuds in my ears and I went out and uh, I was hopeless yeah. <laughs> you know I couldn't understand anyone in anywhere I I missed trains and I got weird orders in cafes and I just um yeah it was it was really interesting and it, it it confirmed everything I had assumed about Caleb's character, about how he would deal with things, that he would very much pretend that everything was fine, you know, nothing's wrong. Um, but it really brought home to me exactly how um, angry he'd get at other people who treated him like he was stupid. It's that sort of feeling of, don't treat me like I'm stupid. Yeah. Um, because you do get very... Uh, weird reactions from people sometimes when you can't understand them. And I think most of us have had a experience of that when you, you've misheard someone or you're in a country where you don't speak the language or you, you've just, um, yeah, you just don't understand something someone said and that, that um, patronizing or sometimes irritated reaction. So uh, yeah, really, uh, really uh, fed into Caleb's character. Mm. And then of course, I, I just spoke to a lot of deaf and hard of hearing people and mm. I read their stories and I heard their stories and mm. it all just um yeah went into the the marinade mm. <laughs> of the books really. Mm. And what's the feedback of people who are deaf have read your book? It's been really lovely. Mm. Um, I, I'm, I'm sure there will be or has been criticism. I, I haven't come across any um, but I think anytime you put yourself out there You've, you've got to accept that there will be. Um, yeah, it, it, it's it's lovely. And, and I've, I've just, I've met a lot of fantastic people through, you know, the process and people just emailing me or coming up to me at talks. It's, it's been really lovely. Um, and I do, of course, get um, a, a deaf uh, reader 
to read the manuscripts to, you know, check my sign language, check that I've got things right about hearing aids, um, all of those sort of things. So, so that's, that's really important for me to get it right. I yeah. Think. Yeah. And when I read your bio, you were a clarinet player. So a bit of a change in career and that, what made that mm. come about? Um, it, it's funny that they're, they're really similar to me. I think um, they, from the outside, I think they can look like, wow, what? it's it's all music and you're in an orchestra and, and then, oh, you're just sitting alone in a room writing. Um, but the funny thing with being a classical musician, you actually spend hours every day practicing in a room by yourself mm. and really um, practicing and developing the nuance of, of a piece. And, and I think writing is very much the same. It's it, a lot of it's to do with rhythm. Um, pacing in a book is all about rhythm. It's, it's the whole book. You don't want it to be boring. You don't want it to be um, too fast. You want the, the slows, the ups, the downs, the quiets, the louds, and, and music's very, very um, like, like that. Um, and I guess in my brain also, they've always worked alongside. So I've always written. Um, I didn't start playing music until I was about 12. Mm. I was actually quite late to it. Mm. Um, but when I first started playing clarinet, I was writing. So they have sort of followed a, a dual path. Mm. And then at various times, <laughs> music was to the fore and then writing absolutely took over. Yeah. Mm. And I was very impressed being a New Zealander to read that you played like with Dame Kerry to Carter. Kerry, oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I was pretty impressed. <laughs> <laughs> it's like we all just went, Dame Kerry. Whereabouts was that? That was um, the Rod Labor Arena. Okay. Um, a fair while ago. Yeah, yeah in Melbourne. In Melbourne, yeah. yeah. Mm. And could you tell us a bit about when you decided that you were going to write? How hard or easy was it to get that first book published? Um, so the process of writing it was really hard. <laughs> um, the process of getting published was slightly unusual in that um, I, I was actually approached by a publisher and uh, that came about uh, for a few different reasons. I'd, um, I'd been told that by various people, uh, either to my face or just by reading things, that if you wanted to get published, you should seriously consider writing short stories, mm. just getting a, a, a few runs under your belt. Um, and, and so I did. Uh, towards the end of writing Resurrection Bay, I started writing short stories. Mm. I was pretty grumpy about, about it. I really didn't mm. want to. But once I started doing it, uh, I really enjoyed the process and I, I think my writing got a lot better for it. Mm. Uh, but it also meant I, I'd won um, the Ned Kelly Short Story uh, Award and the Thunderbolt Award for Short Stories. And um, I'd been looking at what publishers I might eventually send my manuscript out mm. to. It was almost ready to go, but I just couldn't quite get to that stage. And one of the publishers I was interested in, um, we had a bit of a chat on Twitter and she contacted me and, and asked me to, to send the manuscript to her. So I said, oh yeah, a couple of weeks. And then just <laughs> wrote around the clock for two weeks, just polishing, 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 polishing. Um, yeah, and send her the first uh, few chapters. Mm -hmm. And we've got a few people watching. So just wanted to remind people watching, um, if you do have any questions for Emma, please type them in comments and I can read them out. I've got a question from Callie. She wonders what the best part of publishing a book has been for you. Oh, wow, that's a really interesting question. I think it, it really, uh, it's going to sound like a ter terribly wanky answer, but uh, it's actually talking to readers. I really love um, talking and connecting to people who have found something they really like in my books. Um, whether it's just, wow, I, I was having a really bad week and your book just cheered me up to something really mm. um, a lot more profound, like uh, I'm deaf. You know, mm. I never had seen myself on the page before. Oh my God, you know, now I feel like someone's actually seen inside my brain. So th those, all those, um, those different 
conversations um, and and insights into other people's worlds. Um, it's it's fantastic because mm. it is a very um, you, you're just working by yourself mm. for ninety nine point nine percent of the time, and you sort of and you put this you know, <laughs> your little you know gift into the world, and mm. you think people might just throw it back in your face. So so that is lovely. Mm. Yeah. Mm. And Belinda um, says she's read and enjoyed your latest Caleb book. And she wonders if there's going to be more in the series. Yes and no. <laughs> so those who perish, um, I was writing towards that being the last in the series. And mm. it is very much the end of the series. But more and more the last few years, I've been imagining just so much in Caleb's life and Caleb's world that I can imagine... Um, I'm writing something different at the moment, but I can imagine in the future doing a little jump in time and doing that little another trilogy or, or something with him. So uh, that's a long way of saying maybe. <laughs> mm, mm. And when you've uh, during your write, writing, have you had someone who's really encouraged you along the way? Uh, I, I guess my um, my partner's probably the one the most um mm. having said that i didn't let him read any of my writing until uh resurrection bay was published <laughs> but um it just really really uh supporting me <laughs> emotionally yeah and, and now and now he has the very dubious honor of being um talked at when i need to talk through a problem in, in the <laughs> books <laughs> And uh, occasionally I'll, I'll ask him uh, what he thinks and he'll, he'll answer and I'll say, no, you're wrong, but that helps me <laughs> know that I'm going the opposite direction. Um, I also was very lucky in the final draft of Resurrection Day, Bay, which was my first book, um, I worked with a, a mentor, uh, a, a reviewer and critic uh, and editor um, through a program that unfortunately doesn't exist anymore. And um, she is actually Scottish, she lives in Scotland. And mm. so we had an email conversation about it. And she basically, she told me how to ask the right questions of myself mm. and, and what I needed to do to really make everything tighter and, mm. and make really, it's that Michelangelo thing of, you know, chip away the bits that aren't David. <laughs> so I had to chip away the bits that weren't Resurrection Bay. So yeah, the mm. Jeanette Curry, she, she was brilliant, really mm. incredible help. Mm. And what about reading yourself? I can see you've got a few books on your bookshelf there. Um, yeah, the have, you, <laughs> have you got any um, books that you might have read lately that you'd like to recommend to us? Yeah, uh, I'm a huge reader. I read everything. Um, one of my favourite things is when someone says, hey, I love this, read this, <laughs> and I'll read it. Um, yes, I've been doing a lot of rereading this year, mm. actually. Um, the new books I've read... Um, there's been a, I mean, there's a huge crop of Australian crime writing mm. at the moment. Um, so one of the debuts who's making huge names, um, actually is a, an ex-mentee um, men, of mine, um, is Danuka McKenzie. And oh, her, yes. yeah. Yeah, she's her debut, The good. Torrent, was mm. out this year. So she's she's taking off, like, and mm. she's got another one out next year. I haven't read yet. Um, Etha Clifford's When We Fall, um, I really enjoyed. And funnily enough, we've got very similar settings. Um, those who perish is on a rocky windswept island. Um, it, and it was a little inspired by French Island down in Western Port. Mm. I, I mean, it's nothing like the actual island, but like that was where the, the idea came from like, like six years ago is this isolated place where there's 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 no law uh, there's no law, there's no cops, there's no council. It's fantastic. Um, and Aoife, almost set hers on the island luckily she set it on a bay <laughs> but we we both have some similarities with um let's just call them body parts washing up on the beach <laughs> mm. so that's Aoife's uh, when we fall is is really good and then um i've just reread a couple of kate atkinson's jackson Brody series she's a uk writer she writes um lots of different types of books but her jackson Brody books are um they're sort of slow boil crime okay. novels. Really good, very smart, mm. very character driven, uh, very, very, very funny. Yeah, very mm. right. I've been mm. really enjoying them. 
Yeah, and Polly wonders if you have any authors that inspire you. Yeah, look, pretty much everyone. Um, mm. Either because I'm loving their books. Uh, so I just reread um, Melissa Lukashenko's Too Much Lip. Now, mm. uh, and I don't just read crime, I read, read everything, but Too Much Lip is not um, spoken of as a crime novel. It'll just be put on the literary shelf. It, it won the Miles Franklin a couple of years ago. There's a crime at the heart of this book. Actually, there's a couple of crimes. Uh, to me, it's it's absolutely a, a crime novel. Yep. Um, it's yes, sure. It's more more at the um, character end of things. Mm. Um, oops, sorry. Um, that that end. I, I love her play of language, her dialogue, and that is just fantastic. Um, on the opposite end of things, uh, I just read a book that I hated. And I'm not going to name it. I mean, I hated it. I thought it was a dog of a book. Mm. I couldn't believe it was published. Mm. I did not finish it. Mm. That also inspires me because I could think, why am I hating this book? And yeah. so I can take those things and think about them and go, okay, yeah, that, that, I don't want to do that. And I don't want to do that. And, and this is, these are the reasons why. Having said that, other people love this book. So, mm. you know, and mm. courses for courses. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, and, um, Kelly said, have you got a book on your Christmas list? Oh, that's an interesting one. You know what? I haven't because I have a terrible habit of buying books. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, buying books. And now look, it's a great habit, but like I can't actually read all the books mm. I've got. Mm. So um, there's... There's one book I haven't got, um, which I would quite like, which is Gary Dish's new one. Oh yeah, I've heard and that. And it's the yeah. it's the Hirsch it's the latest Hirsch book, and I can't remember the title. But I Gary Dish is great. He's mm. fantastic, and he's consistently good. But I particularly like his Hirsch books, that mm. series set in um, South Australia. Mm. Um, so yes, there you go. Mm. That's my Christmas mm -hmm. wish list. Yeah. And do you have a favourite place to write? Uh, yes and no. Um, I have a few days a week, I have uh, a little cell in the Abbotsford Convent. Okay. Uh, Sounds and interesting. That is brilliant. Mm. Yeah, I've had that for a few years. Uh, usually I just write wherever I am. Mm. Um, but that has been great. It, I really missed it in lockdown. Very, very hard sort of writing when there's, you know, Zoom calls and people playing instruments. Mm. Um, but that is great. And it is a long walk from here. Yeah? An ideal walk is like 45, 50 minutes. Mm. So all the ideas start, you know, just turning, going around. I usually leave there. And it really is. It's an uncell. It's very small. Um, it's very quiet. There is excellent coffee downstairs. <laughs> And I usually finish the day and on my walk home, I'll solve some problem that I've been tackling all day because it's such a lovely long walk. Mm. Um, other than that, oh, yeah, anywhere. Mm. But I've got to say, if I can get somewhere by an ocean for a little riding intensive, that is a huge bonus. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and when you're writing a series, how do you think keep how do you keep things fresh for both yourself and your readers yeah i think that, that was one of the reasons why i wanted to make it a short series mm. i didn't want to um just push beyond where i was super keen to be right i wanted to stop while i really still wanted to go on yeah i, I didn't want to trail out i also didn't want to um <laughs> Everything uh, has repercussions in the book. So when Caleb maybe kills someone, <laughs> rescues someone, mm. gets in trouble, uh, there, there, are, there are consequences. So it, that just couldn't go on for 20, 30 mm. books. 30 books. Mm. Uh, yeah, so that's that's one of the reasons. I always knew it was going to be a short series. And um, when I was writing the second book, I knew how many because I, I knew which characters I was going to work on. For yeah. each of them. So I, I was really keen to so uh, to to do that book about each character. I, mm. I knew that um, the third novel, Darkness for Light, was going to be um, Caleb's ex uh, business partner, and I really wanted to write a book with her. And then I knew Those Who Perish was going to be about 
Kayla's brother and that sibling relationship because I love writing mm. sibling relationships, you know, that, that snarky banter and everything, that mm. love-hate stuff that siblings have. Um, so, yeah, that's how I've, I've, uh, yeah, it's, I've kept it fresh, mm. yeah. Mm. And when you start writing, do you know how your book's going to end? Oh, God, I wish. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if I'm lucky, early in the process, I know the emotional ending of it. Mm. So I know where Caleb's going to end up. Um, hopefully the characters, the main characters around him. I don't usually know how it's going to be plot wise. Mm. Um, so I, I, I'm often sort of just trying out different ideas in my head and on the page. And, um, and then as I get further into the book, it sort of just, yeah, it, it clicks into place. And I, and then I know I'm writing, writing towards that. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks so much for joining us. It's been great chatting to you. It's been a pleasure. Great questions thanks. too. Yeah. And um, yeah, and thanks for the people who asked questions and joined in. Do you want to share with the people watching how they can keep in touch with you? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, usually I'd say Twitter. <laughs> who knows uh, whether Twitter's going to be around, but that, I do chat mm. a lot on Twitter. Mm. I'm on Instagram um, and technically on Facebook as well, all under Emma Biscuit. And I have a website where you can join up my newsletter which is uh very infrequent uh, but <laughs> uh but definitely working on that one yeah, yeah. and maybe even mastodon well we'll see yeah mm. oh, and one last question i forgot to ask you what are you working on at the moment and what mm. can we see next from you something a little different um mm. it is well i guess it's going to be crime novel as well because there's mm. crime involved it's actually historic. It's set between the wars and it's inspired a bit by some real historic events and mm. also uh, some family events uh, that were sort of caught up in it uh, with a very, well, with a very different hero this time. Mm. Yeah. Mm. yeah, sounds a little bit different. Looking mm. forward to really reading it, yeah. that one and maybe we can get you involved in our group again, which would be great. We'd love to, mm. yeah. Well, thanks so much and thanks everyone who joined on. Bye, everyone. Okay.